So this meeting is a hybrid meeting. Uh, there are some folks out in Zoom land also watching. They will be able to participate as well. Um, but uh, it's important that um, when you ever you have the opportunity you'd like to speak, that you use that microphone that's on the stand right here because we want to make sure that we hear everyone um, in Zoom land as well as here. And of course, please speak up. Um, we do have masks in the back available and also copies of the report. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues on the Board of Commissioners, Lee Jones and Penny Githens, and I'm Julie Thomas, a Monroe County Commissioner as well. I will note for the record that we have in attendance State Representative Jeff Ellington and City Council Member Sue Scambolari, both here. Uh, there may also be other elected officials who are joining us uh, via Zoom, but I don't know. Uh, but just so you know, everybody's been invited, so they may be here. We have with us today representatives, uh, representative from Baker and Tilly, the consultants we hired to provide an assessment on annexation. We also will have uh, Jeff Cockrell, from the Monroe County Legal Department. Uh, he'll be joining us via Zoom. And we also have uh, Dustin Dillard, Chief of the Monroe County Fire Protection District here as well. Um, I will note that this is the third in three meetings um, that we have organized in order to um, provide information for you on uh, the proposed annexation by the City of Bloomington uh, with a focus on how it would impact county residents who live outside of the city. Uh, after each um, presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask a question here, or if you're on Zoom, you may do so as well. Um, and uh, you can put that in the chat to panelists, or you can raise your hand if you're on Zoom. Uh, for here, all you have to do is go up to the microphone and start. Um, and so we will begin uh, with uh, Commissioner uh, Lee Jones. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we requested that a second financial study. We requested that a second financial study be done um, to kind of give us a comparison to the city study. It's always a good idea to get a second opinion. And there were a few things, a few assumptions um, in the city financial um, study that we didn't, that we were unsure of. And because of that, we wanted Baker Tilly to look into those things, which they have done. They've reported to us and um, everything is quite a bit cl more clear to us now. And we wanted to be able to bring this to the public so that you will have the information you need and in order to understand exactly what this process is and what it will mean to you. Um, Baker Tilly has done a couple wonderful things. They have created a tool uh, that you can access on the county's website that allows property owners who are in the annex, annexation areas to determine how exactly what kind of effect annexation will have on their tax. And um, that's been a wonderful thing. They have also done a, a thorough analysis of how this annexation might affect the finances of the other taxing units in the county um, including the county, the other taxing units in Bloomington, which would be places like the county, the townships, Ellettsville, public schools, the public library, um, places like that that have their own tax rate. And um, with that, I would like to introduce down here, Dean Rogers, who is a CPA from Baker Tilly and will lead you through the study. Yeah, good evening. Um, 
Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I want to take some time just to walk you through what we've done. Uh, it's been an interesting exercise for me. I, if, for those of you that have that have seen one of these presentations already, I'm often on the other side of this. I, I'm a financial advisor to municipalities, and I'm often involved with helping cities and towns annex. Um, so I kind of brought some different perspective here and seeing the opposite side of that. And, and really, I'm here to help you on behalf of the county. I'm help, here to help inform you uh, to, of the impacts and to help inform the county just so you guys can, can make um, informed decisions about whether or not you feel like this is something that, that you would be in favor of. You know, I suspect I, I know how you may feel if you're, if you're here and, and, and are learning more. Um, but let me get into the tools that are available to you. If you wouldn't mind, could you pull up the county website? I want to make sure you know where you can find the, the, the information that we've provided on the county's website. If you would, actually, I can scroll down. So if you scroll down from the main page under recent news, that the first two links here, it's a link to our report, but then also the tax impact calculator. Um, do you have the calculator to pull up? Okay, sure. Do you want me to screen share this on the calculator? Uh, sure, yeah. There you go. All right, no problem. Thank you. So what you see is in, I actually got a call from a citizen from yesterday's meeting at the fairgrounds today. And uh, I've gotten a couple of calls, which has been interesting because it helps me help you guys. Um, so I want, I want you to know that to find a calculator, first of all, you've got to go to the county's website and pull it up from there. What you'll find is kind of a step-by-step -step process at the top of the screen. So step one is to click on the link that is provided there to go find your tax bill. So if you don't already have your tax bill handy, uh, please go to that link and you can search for your tax bill. You can search either by your parcel number, uh, your, your property address, your name, um, any of those methods to pull up your tax bill. Once you've done that, um, Step two is to select your taxing district. What you see on the screen, there's a drop down menu. Um, so if you click this drop down, there's six different townships for you to select from of, of what your existing taxing district is. And you'll see that pretty clearly on your tax bill. And I'll show you a sample tax bill here momentarily to make it, make it crystal clear where you can find these items. Um, after you select your taxing district, you'll move on to step three and complete items uh, from your tax bill based on the 20 pay 2021 column and fill in boxes 1A, 1B, 1C, and 4C. Um, and then lastly, you'll move on to step four and, and grab information from table five and fill in your deductions. Once you've done that, you'll see in the green boxes below oops, right here your estimated tax impact in dollars and in percentage um we felt this was important for for a couple of reasons and we'll get in get into this a little bit more in a minute but the data you know part of our task was to analyze the information that the city of bloomington put out and what their consultants prepared we did that, and, and, and my task in particular was to look at the impacts on, on you guys as property tax owners, property taxpayers. Um, the information included in the fiscal plan is a, is a little bit outdated now. It's, it's based on 2019 net assessed values for taxes payable in 2020. So the tool that we've developed utilizes 2020 net assessed values for taxes that are payable in 2021. So a year update there, and, and that can be significant in some cases, it may not make much of a difference in other cases. But just one example of a parcel, parcel that I looked up that, that shows how it can be significant is when I looked at that parcel, 
and the impact in the city of Bloomington's fiscal plan, it said that the property tax impact for that taxpayer was $7 and 47 cents. Well, when I updated the values to 2020 pay 21, that impact was $830. So I don't say that to suggest that they're trying to pull one over on you or do something nefarious. I'm just saying updating the data is important. And in this case, the big change was it went from being a homestead property that received all the deductions that come along with that to being, um, you know, a, a different type. It changed hands. There was a transfer of ownership. So it may now be a, um, a rental property or something that falls at the 2% tax cap level as opposed to the 1% tax cap level. So it can be significant. So that's why we thought it was important, why the county thought it was important that we make this tool available to you. So once you've gone through this exercise, you should be able to tie out to your current tax bill within two cents. And, and I say two cents, it's just a rounding issue. You know, the county splits, if you're, this calculator may say that your, your tax bill ends in 57 cents, but as you know, you make two equal payments and the county divides that up and makes it an, an equal number. Um, so it may be off a penny, but you should, you should be within two cents. If you're not, go back to your source, re-enter, um, if for some reason you don't ever tie out, there's going to be contact information for you to reach out to the, to the county, and we'll, we'll, we'll work with them to get that figured out. Um, it's important to keep in mind your tax bill. So can, let me, can I go back to the county's website? Or actually our report. Yep. So you'll also find this report on the county's website that, that includes a lot of the same information. It's just not interactive as far as calculating your tax bill. So once you get to this point, in order to make sure you're tying out to your tax bill, you could keep scrolling to a next page and you'll get details behind the calculations. So here is your current or pre-annexation tax bill. And there's a green box right here that should tie it to your existing tax bill. And then if you keep scrolling, there's a post-annexation calculator that shows what the tax bill would be post-annexation. So if you want to see the details, just keep scrolling. But I want, to, I want to share with you what your tax bill looks like and where this source data comes from that you would plug into the calculator. So when you go to the link and, and find your data, this is the first page of what your tax bill would look like. I've kind of marked out, even though it's public information that anyone could find for anyone, I've kind of blacked out the identifying information for this person. Um, if you proceed to the second page, step two was to, to input your taxing district. This is where you'll find that in this highlighted area. In this case, it was Van Buren Township. Step three was to enter data from 1A, 1B, and 1C. So over here in table one, that's where you find that. And make sure you're entering the values from the 2020 pay 21 column. And then also, if you qualify for an over 65 circuit breaker credit, that's gonna be in 4C. Make sure you're inputting any value that you have there as well. And then step four was to go to table five and make sure you input any deductions that are down here in, in the 2021 column. When I say that you should tie out to your property tax bill, it's important that you don't include the other assessments that are identified on your tax bill. For instance, if we look at this one, well, so you should tie into what you see right here in table one, this amount. But if you look at the first page, this is a semi-annual installment you'll notice that if you double that, it's more than what you see on the next page. The reason for that is there's an other assessment there 
of $37.88. That's related to a stormwater fee. So we're talking about just the property tax component only. Um, so make sure you keep that in mind when, when you're double checking that you're actually tying out. So a little bit more background on why we did this and why we felt it was important. Put together a couple of frequently asked questions just to um, get that in your hands and, and explain why there may be some differences. So question one was, when I utilize the property tax calculator on the county's website, I get a different result from what is shown in the fiscal plan on the city's website. Why is that? So potentially, some of those reasons could include a couple of these we've discussed already. The tax impacts in the fiscal plan are based on 2019 assessments, which are outdated at this point in time. Uh, per Indiana Code, the parcel list should include the most recent assessed value of the parcel. This can be, and you know, I get it. it it's, it's time consuming to put together a fiscal plan. Sometimes the timing doesn't help you in, in getting the most recent data. But um, for our purposes, we did use the current 2020 net assessed values for taxes payable in 21. And I gave you that example of why that can be very important. So by using this most recent data, we're capturing changes in ownership, assessed values, tax rates, and, and any other factors. You know, if there is a change in ownership that perhaps changes it from being a homestead to a rental property or something like that, it's gonna get captured. Another thing is you may have noticed if you've looked at the city's fiscal plan and looked at the individual property tax impacts, I feel like it's kind of overly complicated. And, and the reason for that is they have built in an assumed 12% growth over a four year period. Um, we haven't done that in the tax calculator. We're just doing an apples to apples comparison. Here's what your tax bill is today in unincorporated Van Buren Township, whatever township you're in versus what your tax bill would be today if you were in Bloomington. So with that additional uh, corporate tax rate. They factored in 12% growth, which you know, may or may not happen. Um, we did not, we just felt you know, the growth is speculative, may or may not occur with or without annexation. In addition, what makes this especially important is the growth is applied improperly in the fiscal plan. They've applied that growth to gross assessed values as opposed to net assessed values, um, which is not really the proper way to go about that in my view. If you're applying it to net assessed values, or I'm sorry, if you're applying it to gross assessed values, that means it's inconsistent. If you're applying it to net assessed values, then you would adjust the applicable deductions appropriately as well, and it would be consistent across all types of parcels, whether they had deductions or not. Um, in addition, the breakdown between the tax, so in the fiscal plan, they break down your tax bill increase between the increase due to that assessed value growth and the increase due to annexation. They've calculated that incorrectly, in my opinion. Um, if there were no other changing factors, the way they did it would make sense, but there is a changing factor and it's the tax rate. Um, so because of that, they understate the tax bill increase due to AV growth and overstate the tax bill increase due to annexation. So we've simplified it in the calculator that you have on the county's website. It, it, it pulls that growth assumption out of there. So question two then, is it possible that my tax impact from annexation could be different by the time a successful annexation would become effective in 2024 for taxes payable in 2025? And yes, it is entirely possible. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's likely that it'll be different. Um, so over the next four years, it's likely that assessments and tax rates will change many of which will be out of the control of specific individual taxing units. However, the estimated tax impacts calculated by the tool on the county's website are the best estimates based on the facts as known today. So yeah, there's, there's gonna be little changes here and there. There's gonna be like the example I gave from 19 to 20, there was a big change there because of a transfer in ownership. So you can expect some of those changes from year to year, but this will give you a real, uh, real good feel for what your 
tax impact is based on what we know today. So I'm going to take a pause there for a minute. Uh, normally, I have a colleague with me that um, covers another topic, and I'm going to I'm going to cover that tonight. But we're we're going to have what three or four different kind of sections here, and um, we can we can take questions at the end. But if you do have questions now that is specific to your property tax impact, um, we can pause for a moment and take any of those questions. Otherwise, we can hold them until we get get towards the end. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Please. And yeah. Please, please go to the microphone and just state your name. Yeah. Number two, um, to clarify this meeting, it seems like we're going over the tax issues, assuming we're going to go through with it. And and I I came here assuming that. We're going to talk about what we're going to deal with to 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 negotiate with this or fight it. Sure. So, by what we're talking about right now, it's throwing me a curveball because it's almost like we're buying into it already. We will actually be covering those aspects in a little while. All right. This is just. Is that for the, sure? Yes. Yeah. Are, they, are the answers going to get? Are the questions going to be answered? To the best of our ability. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer McKell, and I'm wondering, um, and this may be answered in the future as well, but regarding um, our tax increase, which would start immediately whenever it became successful, um, what value we would actually see? I have septic and I have electricity. Wi-Fi, it's all like private, you know? And so I want to know what is the schedule that the city has to follow according maybe to the state or wherever that they have to give me value for my money. And I don't know if that's now to ask, but that is something I'm interested in. Sure. I can address part of that question, um, particularly regarding schedule. You know, so Indiana Code states that uh, the city will have to provide non-capital services, and those are things like police protection, street maintenance, in an equivalent manner to what they provide within their existing corporate boundaries within one year of the effective date of annexation. Um, capital services, things like water, sewer, uh, street construction, those types of things have to be provided within three years of the effective date of annexation again, in an equivalent manner to the way they provide it within their existing corporate boundaries. So, you know, some of that's going to depend on their existing policies. So just further to that, at my uh, intersection, we don't have curbs. Mm -hmm. Now, I am not interested in curbs, but are we going to have to have curbs? Um, some of those things are really... Um, sort of egregious to me that we should have to look like the city. We have to ask for uh, whether we can have, you know, a cow, all these things. These are really the problems. This is our freedom. This is why we may have pr purchased the property. And um, anyway, so are we going to have to have curbs? Are we going to have to have these things that um, define us as a countryside? Yeah, I think that is a question that's going to have to be addressed to the city. Um, we're all county here, and these are decisions that the city will be making. Right. No. Hello, my name is Margaret Clements, and in the course of my collection of signatures around all of the annexation areas, I've also been receiving some phone calls from people who underwent the last annexation. So I was curious about your response about uh, the provision of services and the requirement that the city provide the services within a timely fashion. And I've been, it's been reported to me that the residents who underwent involuntary annexation the last time still do not have city sewer as promised to them. 
And so I just wonder what recourse do they have? Can they, can that annexation be voided? Yeah, you know, good question. And, and I'm, I want to be careful here because I'm not an attorney and, and we don't want to give legal advice. Um, I will say, I mean, there is a mechanism in Indiana code for disannexation. If, if services aren't being provided the way they should be, um, so, so that is in the law. Since we have uh, Mr. Ellington here, I would just really like to request that that could be an, a matter of automatic dissolution of the annexation, because why should the citizens have to work so hard? And especially with this annexation, it requires 100% of the property owners, whereas uh, to, vo to remonstrate, it only requires 65%. So I just think it places too high a burden on the residents when uh, promises are remain unfulfilled for something they never wanted in the first place. So thank you for hearing me and I know you'll do what you can. Thank you. Would that have an effect on the numbers as they are right now? And if so, how much? Um, well, there will be factors that change. And, and some of that is, you know, you, you're probably, we're in a really hot real estate market, right? We're seeing prices of homes go through the roof. Ultimately, that impacts your assessed values because of trending and, and the way the county has to do assessments. Um, so that's impactful. If, if your assessed value goes up, now, it gets complicated pretty quick because that's just part of a formula of determining the tax rate, right? So um, the levy or the amount of property taxes that a taxing entity can raise is, is called the levy. And that levy can grow by a, a growth quotient each year. It's based on like the six-year average non-farm income. Um, so that levy often grows, you know, somewhere between three and 4%. I think we're seeing some year, I think maybe in this most recent year, it's 4.2%. Um, in Bloomington's fiscal plan, um, I believe they assume some growth in that. So long-winded answer, but yes, you'll see, you'll likely see changes in assessed values for properties. You know, you're going to see that levy growing by that growth quotient each year. So depending on that relationship, that calculates your t the tax rate. So, you know, when levies are growing higher than, uh, I'm sorry, when assessed values are growing higher than the levy, that growth quotient is, you see tax rates go down, you know, which is good for property owners. Some people it's gonna help out, others may already be at the tax cap and it makes no difference. Um, you know, but the, the reverse could be true. You know, maybe assessed values aren't growing by that same rate that um, the levy is growing by that growth quotient and you see tax rates go up some. Again, in that case, some people may already be at their tax caps and won't really feel an impact. Um, others would see a tax increase. So there are a lot of moving parts and pieces that, that are hard to predict. So that's why we wanted to kind of just give you a static view based on what we know today. Jennifer McCallaghan. Um, so assessed values from the government are usually quite different than say Zillow and people escaping from California and everybody assuming they're gonna buy things at a high rate, which seems to be the case at the moment. Extraordinary, five acres I saw with this little old house that isn't worth anything. And it was, um, you know, $290,000 and, and you know, that was just bizarre because I know that the property values there are about 9,000 an acre. But we're talking assessment is like from the government, not, not what just some realtor wants. Right. Right. And it's also what uh, concerned with um, what, what things are being sold around the house, around the area, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the county folks may have a better feel for it than I do, but I mean, over time, it, it is supposed to reflect fair market value. Good evening again. After seeing you yesterday, my name is Pam Snyder. 
My mother lives next to Jennifer down here, just two miles down the road, and I've been getting a lot of information from the Monroe County Assessor's Office and the Treasurer's Office today. First of all, your calculator only works if you're on a computer. If you're on your phone, it does not work, so don't try while you're sitting here. I went home and had to figure that out the hard way. Um, also, uh, you said rates will be approximately 8 to 10 percent higher. Um, they will be. I called today, my mother's property was under 200,000. She's 88, gonna be 89 soon. And I wanted to get this 65 under 200 credit thing. She's never had it, she has dementia. I took over her bills last year. I didn't know about it, I'm not 65. Nobody tells you about these wonderful things you can get done. I called today and they said, no, you can't have it. Your house has been reassessed. I'm like, what? You know, this 60, the house was built by my grandparents when my mother was pregnant with me. There have been no improvements to that house. <laughs> I can testify to it because everything's breaking and we're fixing it daily. Um, and they told me now it's gone up from 190, I think I had down 198,600 to 216,000. That's more than a 10% increase. So when you're wanting to figure these things out, figure out what you owe this year, add 10% to the value of your house. So if it's 200, it's 220,000 now and figure that up on your calculator. Um, the assessor's office tells me they cannot give you those credits. It, it, you, I would have had to have done it last year for this year. It doesn't matter that we're here and we're now and we haven't lived in next year. That's the way taxes are. I realized that <laughs> I used to pay the taxes for the IU Credit Union for 90 some counties in Indiana and all the surrounding states for all the properties we had. That was part of my job. But that does not mean that the elderly citizens of Monroe County should get screwed. And that's what it is because they don't know. If somebody's had a house for over 45 years in Monroe County, guess what? They're over 65. And if that property is less than 200,000, it should have automatically been put on these rolls with this. My mother doesn't have all these things now and she can't have them. She'll probably live to be a hundred. The woman's in great shape. She just doesn't have a mind. And it upsets me to think we can't do anything about it. We're here at this meeting and it's wonderful that we have these tools, but all we're being told is how much more we're gonna pay and to wait till the end for remonstrance. And we have to wait until they annex us to do that. And I'm sorry, <laughs> this is more than frustrating, more than frustrating. And I know for a fact, you look at those lines over there. I found out they pulled one of the lines back from the original pictures I had. My oldest daughter's house that's over towards Ellisville, they pulled it just this way off of Arlington Road a little bit from her edition. But yet, I'm sure some other lines have, have moved slightly. But I know for a fact, they're going out towards the lake. They're going out Fairfax. I live out that way. I live a mile away, and I know they're coming down there. It has nothing to do with growing the city. It has all to do with controlling things. And something you pointed out, which I really appreciate is, the city of Bloomington does not own the city of Bloomington Utilities. That's their name. The state of Indiana, the Department Corps of Engineers built that lake. When I was four years old, I'd been in the bottom of it while I was being dredged out. And the city of Bloomington does not control it. They cannot tell you whether or not you can have utilities and you have to sign away your life and say that you'll pay higher taxes because of it. So something needs to be done short of just telling us all these wonderful rules because it needs to get out to all of Bloomington. They need to take full ads and the paper and say, here's all the things you need to do now so that they don't get hurt the way my mother's being hurt as a citizen here of all these years. I would just like to clarify one thing um, the annexation does not actually occur until after the remonstrance period is over with. So it's not a matter of you have to already be annexed before you can do anything about it. You are going to be able to do a whole lot about this before you ever get annexed, and we will be getting into that. But are they not voting on it? Even if they don't know, then you have to fight it. What? What happened? I understand that they're going to vote, which means it's yes, unless we as people individually show up and sign these papers and you look at this room. This isn't one little addition down the road here. 
I know the people of this area. I grew up here. I went to school here. I've been to six schools in this town. My parents are military. I moved. I've been to 11 different schools. This is pathetic that we only have this many people here. But it's because of information. No one knows. Or like the city's having their meeting at 3 o'clock on Wednesday. I'm at school at 3 o'clock. I'm, I'm down here at South. Am I supposed to speed or am I supposed to leave the kids? What am I supposed to do to try to stop them from doing this? They should not be able to have meetings when the public cannot attend. Are there any further questions from the audience here in the building? I, I'm sorry, are there any further questions about the part of the Baker Tilly report that you've heard so far? Let me let me elaborate on on one thing I just heard and I appreciate your perspective and I don't say this to take away from your point, but just to avoid a big rush of over 65 folks heading to the county. Um, to qualify for the over 65 circuit breaker credit, it's there's an there's an income uh, component to that as well. Your income must be below a certain level. Um, so it's important to know about that and, and those that qualify should certainly get signed up for that or make sure they're getting it. But yeah, I just wanted to make that point. Not I understand that because if somebody lives in a cheap house, they probably don't make much money. The people that have more money generally live in nicer houses. Well, let me, I know, so I think everyone wants to hear a little bit more about the remonstrance process. So I've got one more item to cover. You want me to go ahead and get through um, that briefly? I'm sorry, I, I'd just like to ask if there are any questions from <laughs> Zoom at this point. I have there are not. Okay, then please do All right. continue. So, like I said, well, I'll be brief on this because I'm not sure that I think this is important and it can have an impact on you. Um, but I, what I want to talk about is the impact on other overlapping taxing units. So, what I mean by that is when when a, City, City of Bloomington in this case, annexes, it, it not only impacts them, but it impacts other overlapping taxing units, being the townships, the schools, the library, the county, um, for various reasons. One of those is a shift in, in property tax caps or circuit breaker losses. So I'm not, just real briefly, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say circuit breakers. So you know, your the values of your homes are are capped at one, two, or three percent, or the value of your property, depending on what type of property it is. So, if you're a, if it's a homestead property, it's your primary residence. Um, it, it can get complicated, so I'll simplify it here. But you're you're capped out at not paying more than one percent of your gross assessed value in taxes. You know, if, if you're if it's farmland or it's a rental property, you're going to be at that two percent cap level. So you wouldn't pay more than two percent of your gross assessed value. Commercial industrial properties they fall up to three percent cap level. So when I say when the city annexes and adds in the city tax rate, it can have an impact on circuit breaker losses and all of the overlapping taxing units share in, in those circuit breaker losses because they're a part of the overall taxing district. Yeah, so good question. Circuit breaker loss is, so they're still going to bill you, or I'm sorry, they're still going to calculate what your tax bill would be kind of ignoring those circuit breakers, but they're going to show a credit on your bill, a circuit breaker credit. And, um, basically a deduction that you do to show a net amount due. And those circuit breaker credits are kind of considered a revenue loss to all of the taxing units because they may have a levy, a certain amount of property taxes that they can generate, but that's gonna be reduced because of people hitting their circuit breakers and receiving circuit breaker credits. So they really can't receive in many cases, all of their property tax levy due to tax caps. So a shift in circuit breaker is, is one reason why overlapping taxing units can lose dollars. Also a, a significant 
uh, potential impact is in, in the allocation of income taxes. So in this case, local income taxes are, are primarily distributed based on your property tax levy. Um, in this case, the city of Bloomington has, has indicated in their fiscal plan that their levy would go up by roughly $8 million. Um, so when their levy goes up, their percentage of levy compared to all other units, it causes all the other units kind of percentage of the total to go down. So their, their allocation of local income taxes goes down while the city's goes up. So one of our tasks was to look at the information prepared by the city's consultants and you know, take a look at, are their assumptions reasonable? Are we coming up with different results? So I wanna point out, um, can we pull up the, the report? I wanna point out just the summary page of this and kind of hit the highlights briefly. There's a lot of detail in the report that you can view through the county's website, but let's take a look at this. Let's see, hopefully it doesn't happen again when I scroll. <laughs> So here's what I want you to see. On the right hand side is the information for the first four years following annexation prepared by the city's consultant. On the left hand side is kind of our information restated. And we've highlighted year two in each of these columns because that's when the biggest impact is felt. Um, there's a delay in the distribution of local income taxes of a year. So that's, that's that first year that that redistribution is effective. And really the biggest differences that we identified was for the county. Um, in year two, per the Bloomington report, it indicates a loss to the county of, of about 1,859,000. Um, there was a big difference in our calculations of their loss in local income taxes. And we're estimating a loss exceeding about 2.7 million for the county. The other significant variances on here were, uh, there, was a, there was a little bit of a difference with the Monroe County Library. Uh, the Bloomington report estimated a loss of 179,000. We're estimating a loss of 273,000. And then also with the Monroe Fire Protection District, um, we're indicating a loss of just over $500,000, which is about $142,000 higher than indicated in the city's report. So, you know, I know you may not have great interest in that, but, but it potentially impacts you all as well because you receive services from all of these entities. And if they have reduced revenues to provide these services, it can, can be imp impactful to you as property owners. With that, I'll, I'll pause and we can take questions or move on to another section. Please. Please state your name first. Barry Nowling, uh, Van Buren Township. I don't know if everybody realizes that the city gets 60% of our county taxes we pay right now. That's not been brought up. That should be brought up. I learned that the last time they tried this and that needs to be publicized. So we're already paying city taxes that we don't get to get, do anything with or even vote for. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer McCalligan. Um, so the last time we were talking about, there was a lot of emphasis on, on monies being taken away and having to be reorganized in a really expensive way for the uh, fire departments. And so I'd, we haven't mentioned that in, in all of our, you know, just um, casual <laughs> mentionings of people, things that we like that we need that are going to be lost. So it would be great to know something about that too. That's why Chief Dillard is here with us tonight. He's going to address that for you. Any questions? 
And do we have any further questions from the audience here? Do we have any Zoom questions? We do not. <laughs> All right. That's the disembodied voice of one of our TSD people. Pam Snyder, can I just say, the other night you guys said something that I thought was really smart, and I don't know which one of you said it, so I'm not saying other people aren't smart, but um, what they're not realizing is the shortage of 200 and some thousand to the library, and the shortage of a half a million to the school corporation, and the shortage of this, that, and the other. First of all, the city's getting our money. I don't know what they're doing with that extra $8 million, but they're not paying those places because now they're short. The county who stays the county who doesn't get annexed has to make up the county taxes or we're going to lose something. So the people that think they don't have any skin in the game better start showing up because all the people like me who live on the other side of the line from my mother are going to start paying more because we have to pay for these things. We can't just say we aren't going to have schools. We can't say we aren't going to have a library. We can't say we aren't going to do these things. And the people in the city of Bloomington, they're going to lose some of their services or they're going to call the road crew and say, I need this done. We've got this big hole. And they're going to say, well, we're sorry. We're all the way out on highway, blah, 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 on the west side of town right now. We'll get to you maybe next year. So city's not going to get the services they want. County's going to be paying extra. And these poor people are being messed over too. So it's not good for anybody. The annexation just needs to stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I just want to note that there are indeed a number of services provided by the county for every resident of the county, whether they live in the city, a town or not. Uh, from the smallest, which is probably weights and measures, a one person department to make sure that um, scales are appropriate and gas is measured correctly at the pumps. Uh, to the justice system, which is huge, uh, a huge expense that um, the county uh, taxpayers pay for. Um, and indeed, um, everything that shifts in terms of tax dollars means either something has to be reorganized, we have to find a new way to pay for it, or service uh, may be adjusted. Um, and you're used to excellent service from Monroe County government. Uh, we want to ensure that we do everything we can to continue that. The council, the county council, which is the fiduciary branch of county government, will be making some hard decisions if annexation goes through. Um, that's just how that is. But thank you for raising that. And I do have one thing from the Zoom chat. Marty Hawk says, reminder that rents most likely will increase due to the increase in tax of up to 2% of the value of the property. Thank you. Right. If you'd like to go ahead. Hi, I'm Dennis Richardson. I live on Church Lane. I'm also president of Clear Creek Cemetery. And back in 17, I was located by a lawyer from the city of Bloomington. And they was wanting us to donate the track behind the cemetery to put a walking trail in. So see, they've already had this plan before they even gonna annex us. And I told them, I said, well, it won't have any place to go because the trestle has been taken out. They said, no, we're gonna put a new trestle in. So there's where millions of dollars are gonna be spent. So they're planning on doing that, not even telling anybody. I just want people to know what they're planning on doing with their money. Pardon? Okay. That, yeah. The city's planning on putting a walking trail behind the city of Bloomington, or behind this Clear Creek Cemetery. Because they took and located, or got a hold of me in 17 and wanted us to donate the property to them to put a walking trail in. Okay. The old train track. Rails to trails. <clears throat> but there, the, the trestle has been taken out a long time ago across the highway. And they said they're going to, I said, there's no trestle in. They said, we're going to put a new trestle in. So there's where your millions of dollars are going to go. Seeing they're not telling anybody this, they're just going to do it. Oh, I'm not going to give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, part of this evening also is to talk about the remonstrance process, what that is, how it happens, what the percentages are needed in each area, and the timeline. And so tonight, via Zoom, we have County Attorney Jeff Cockrell, who is going to be talking about some of these things, and we will also take questions from the audience um, for what Jeff's going to be talking about. So Jeff, are you ready? 
I, I am ready, and I would just start off by saying that the rules I'm about to speak of were not uh, instituted by the county. These are state statutes of so state rules. Um, I know that there are some concerns about some of the rules, and I just want to start off by saying that, you know, they're not ours. They're, they're the rules that we've been given, and that they're the rules we've got to deal with. The first thing I, I want to point out is that the remonstration period does not begin until after uh, the city council that makes a passes an ordinance that says this is what we're this is what's going to be added to the city, and they give notice to um, in accordance with the statute. Um, I think I'm going to delve a little bit into what that notice that that entails when I say the, the city has to give notice. Uh, they've got to do a couple of different things. The first is they've got to publish it in accordance, basically publish it in the paper. Um, and then, but they also have to send a first class or, or other or certified mail, something to you uh, that has a return receipt associated with it. And they've got to have a lot of information in there. Um, they've, got to, they've got to let you know um, when the remonstrance period runs for not that that the remonstrance period runs for 90 days uh, they've got to tell you a uh, location um, where you can sign a petition of remonstration uh, that that has to be a public place a governmental um, park something like that uh, throughout the course and then they have they have to have uh, at least five days at a location uh, where you where you can sign that as well, and again, it, it follows some of those those guidelines. Um, so that period that won't start um, until later. I've, the public hearing for the city council is Wednesday, and the state statute says that the city council cannot make a determination or approve an ordinance um, for annexation within 30 days after that public hearing, and they also can't wait longer than 60 days after that public hearing. So there's a public hearing, wait 30 days, and then they have a 30 day period to, to make a, some kind of determination. So that's kind of the timeline where we're at now with the remonstration. Uh, like I said before, the remonstration period will run for 90 days. Um, there are no penalties for someone signing a petition for remonstration, uh, be that they don't live in the area or they have a valid waiver of annexation. And I'll talk a little bit more about the waivers of annexation in just a second, uh, but there's no penalty or anything like that. The, the process is such that uh, the auditor's office gets the list of people who have signed the, uh, a petition for remonstration. Uh, they, they give a copy of that to the city of Bloomington's uh, city council. The city council then has a period of time where they would give the auditor's office the information that shows, hey, here's a valid, this property has a valid waiver of annexation or not. Uh, the auditor reviews that. And then after that, the auditor either certifies that it is a valid uh, petition for remonstration or not, depending on uh, what, whether the they're a, they're, they are a property owner in the district that pays property taxes, tax exempt uh, uh, property is not eligible. Owners of tax exempt property are not allowed to sign a petition of remonstration. They also aren't kind of counted in the, de the de denominator when I talk about percentages. So they're kind of just taken out of the whole equation. Um, they, there are waivers of annexation. There's a state law that indicates that a waiver and there are some exceptions within that law, but essentially, uh, if it's 15 years or older, it is no longer a valid waiver of annexation. The auditor's office is going to um, review all the petitions under the guidance of that, that code section. And I think the other main thing I want to talk about tonight is the uh, percentages. Um, so each, the, 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 the city of Bloomington has proposed several different annexation areas. So these guidance would apply to each one individually. In essence, they're doing several different annexations all at once. Um, so in each of, the, each of the areas, if more than 51% of the property owners, and again, property owners are only uh, tax, taxable real property, owner, owners of taxable real property in those areas, um, if 
to 65 percent uh, of the property owners sign a petition of remonstration in that area, then it, it can be appealed to the to the courts for judicial review. If more than 65 percent of the uh, property owners in any area uh, sign a sign the petition for remonstration, then, then that annexation ordinance is voided um, pursuant to state law. Uh, the other there's another test based upon assessed value, and essentially, if you're over 80% of the assessed value, property owners who have who own over 80% of the assessed value in that area, then that is also a voided um, remonstra a voided ordinance of annexation. So those are kind of the rules, and I apologize for not being there, but I uh, have other other commitments here with with my children. Um, but if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Or if you, if there's anything I missed, please just let me know. Once again, Pam Snyder. Uh, at last night's meeting, someone brought up the fact that Cook um, made a deal because they're a corporation and they pay a large amount of money uh, not to be assessed. Will their assessed value be included because obviously they own a big chunk of land uh, in that area out there by Highland Park so that the people can't fight this. I, I guess my understanding, and, I, and I, I was not part of the agreement with, with Cook, so I don't really, I can't really say for certainly with what, what's in it, but if they have a, a, if they have an agreement in lieu of annexation, um, and my understanding is that they do, and the time period and that, that agreement has not expired, although I have not physically seen the agreement, then they were the, the city, if they included them in the annexation area, would have a contractual dispute with, with the Cook Group. Um, and, if, and if it's not included in the area of annexation, then they, there is, they wouldn't be property owners within the uh, area that is proposed to be annexed. So either they include it, and then that leads to some contractual issues uh, with Cook, potentially. Again, I have not seen the document. Or the, they don't include them, in which case they, they wouldn't count either way towards the petition or the petition and remonstrance process. Hi, Jamie Ford again. Um, uh, you said that. Uh, um, they have the have to vote within like 30 days after the public hearing. Um, but if I remember correctly, they also have to let everyone that's interested be able to speak about it. So, but there's only been one day planned for it from like three to nine. So when does that vote take place after they've added on additional hearings to let the 6,000 parcel owners speak? Or is it from August 3rd? Well, I... I I don't know what the city is planning. Um, the statute says that after the notice public hearing, they have to wait 30 days uh, before they can approve the ordinance. Now, if the public hearing goes on and on, and if it's all concluded on the 4th, then I think 30 days from the 4th is when it is. If they add additional times and dates, um, I'm not positive on the answer to that, but I would, but I guess if, if I were, advising, I would say I would use 30 days from the last date. And I would, but I would be wary of making sure that all those um, public hearings occurred so that the decision could still be made 60 days after the initial day. And then um, I do plan on being in person at City Hall when this happens. Um, so do you know how long we have to speak? I do not know the city's okay. rules uh, for for that, so I would I would contact the city and ask them what their rules are for length of speaking. Uh, according according to right according to what's at the city's website for the meeting. In fact, you can pull off the agenda for the meeting. It says you can speak for one three minute comment period. I'm gonna have to talk fast. All right, thanks. <laughs> Be organized. <laughs> So I'm interested uh, in whether it, whether they, it, they are, it is necessary for them to declare 
uh, why the annexation is a valid desire for the Bloomington city in with detail. Um, I think it's quite different from Terre Haute or any of the larger actual cities. Um, I don't know how we snuck in as being a city, but there was something that made us be able to be a city. And then now we have this problem. But I was also wondering if, um, you know, Mayor mayoral King Hamilton gets to vote. And I think maybe the answer is no. And then that is perhaps how the people will be, re uh, our representatives will actually represented, re represent the uh, desires of the people. Thank you. I would just say that it is the city council who votes on this, not the, the mayor's office. Okay, I, I'm Barry Nowling. I learned this the last time this was going on, that if we did get in annexed, we, we don't get to vote for four years on anything, anybody in city council or mayor, and, and uh, with everything going on around the country, voters' rights and all that, that seems like my rights getting took away because I'm, I'm an American, I'm an Indiana citizen, I'm a Bloomington citizen, Monroe County citizen. I have the right to vote. And that's one thing that I don't agree with that we should get to vote on city council, mayor, all that crap. As legal representative, um, I think some things have been raised about why we're trying to get this money in the first place and why we're being annexed. So I just looked it up, being that I work for a school, that's what I do. And it says, when faced with budgetary problems, an urban government in that state permits forcible annexation and they have certain choices. They can reduce their spending, which obviously we're not doing. They can raise taxes or they can add high value property to its boundaries. On the other hand, if the municipality wants to annex you involuntarily, there is essentially no recourse. And all I can say to that is, the reason this country is this country is because in December 16th, 1773, the Boston Tea Party happened. You do not tax people without representation. And the mayor and the city council needs to know that. And they might say, we don't care if we get reelected in four years. Well, if you plan on living in this town, the people of Bloomington will remember you. I would just like to make a note for the public record that the um, city accountants have come out, Mr. Underwood has come out and stated that they have a surplus and that they have no financial need, just to let you know for the record that the city has, uh, the city's uh, officials have said the financial need is not there. They have a surplus. Hello, my name is Colby Wicker. Uh, I'm one of the founding members of County Residents Against Annexation. Uh, I wanted to also bring, bring uh, to, to the record here, and I want to uh, underscore uh, Mr. Cockrell's point that anybody and everybody is allowed to remonstrate. Well, we've heard some pretty disconcerting reports from, the, uh, from individuals who've called into the city and they've asked the city attorney if they are allowed to remonstrate. And he says, no, don't remonstrate. They're, they're gonna be thrown out. Um, and, and while we're here, I would like to ask the county attorney to uh, look into that maybe. And, and, I, and while Ms. Scamparelli is here also, I would like to ask if she could uh, do some looking into that as, as well, because that is very, dis it's, it's disconcerting when, uh, when a citizen calls a public official asking for information and they give you knowingly and willingly wrong information. And, and I don't think that that should be allowed. Um, and also, just as one point on, on the voting, um, the, the city council gets to decide when people are brought in uh, to the process. They could decide to move that date back to November the 1st of 2023, and all of you guys would be allowed to vote in the city elections. But instead, they decide to move the date to January 1st, 2024, in which you guys will not have voting rights within the city for the 2023 uh, municipal elections. So. Um, I, and uh, I just want to add for clarification, and I think it's Jeff uh, Cockrell mentioned this, but just to be clear, 
you can't actually sign a remonstrance petition until after the city council passes its ordinance. I just want to make sure everybody understands that you can't actually sign and remonstrate against something yet. And, oh, and it, right it, now they have scheduled that particular meeting for September the 15th, I believe. So just to be very clear, this document that you signed is a formal petition. It is not a remonstration. It only states that you intend to remonstrate against the city of Bloomington should they annex you. And the purpose of this form is to, to convince city council that they should not annex you so that they could save the division of our community and that they could uh, stop it right here because it's in the city uh, council's hands to vote no on annexation. And that's our goal with this petition is to convince them to vote no. And to that end, I'm collecting signatures on petitions Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 3 to 6 p.m. at the Perry Township Trustee's Office at 1010 South Walnut Street. And Colby Wicker and Rita Barrow and the office staff at the Van Buren Trustee's Office, a Township Trustee's Office are accepting signatures on petitions through to the end um, mon every day of the week from nine to four with the exception of a one hour break at lunch. And we're here to serve you. And I'm gonna be there uh, at the Perry Township Trustee's Office for three hours, er three days a week throughout the petition period and throughout the, the remonstration period. And if there's anybody shut in who can't get out, let me know, I will go to them. Thank you. So, Jeff, is there any, Mr. Ellington, is there anything that say, say this whole horrible thing happens and everybody has to pay all this money for nothing and you know, the city is supposed to, I thought by the state, you're supposed to have some reason for, for um, progress. It, we, it is not supposed to, I think your, your move, whatever, I can't remember what it was uh, that you were asking for a law, maybe it was, um, to, they came back and said, um, you can, we can't stop cities from, they didn't wanna stop cities from being able to have progress. So I want to know what the progress is, of course, which I, I asked before that there. Um, then I went backwards. So uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm wondering what the if, if this whole thing actually happens and that we are um, going to have to pay all this, can we in some way make it so that our freedom our freedom to use our property the way we want to use our property, where we do not have to ask for permits for animals, the reasons why we went out there, you know, being able to be mini farmers or whatever it is that our dream is that we went out to do, that we bought the property for, um, that this would, this would be, this kind of annexation would be stopped. So we would not have to do all those niggly little laws that they have when you live on top of one another in a city. And I'm just wondering, where do we get, where do we go from there at that point, you know? Thank you. Yes, please. So thank you for the question that uh, gets me up here where I can a answer some more because we had a lot of questions at last night's meeting. And I get phone calls and uh, a lot of emails to my office in Indianapolis about this very issue. So first, let me just say that starting back in 1996, when I was first elected to the county council, I spent two election cycles there. My main reason to be there is why we're all here today, is to give people a voice in the process, whatever it takes. If you'll recall in 2017, there was some language that got put in the budget that stalled this process and really it got stalled for a five year time frame, just so the state, which we were in uh, deliberation about annexation, uh, cause we just got over annexation changes in 2015. We didn't think it went far enough to protect citizens. So we were right back at the table and they wanted to give us some breathing room to help come up with some better legislation that would help this process. Um, so the waiver language, um, actually, I had a bill in 2019 
um, that my bill didn't get a hearing in uh, the house for that issue, but I was able to pull out the fire protection district that uh, Perry Clear Creek and their uh, staff helped write um, to help protect fire districts. Uh, we treated it as school districts, so it wasn't fair to us uh, that a large school district could come in and annex a little school district to pull all its revenue out. And we didn't think it was proper for whether it's a township fire city or, uh, or town itself to do the same thing with uh, fire services. And so that's one of the, the bills we pulled out. My language uh, that was in that bill that dealt with waivers actually was set on a 10 year time frame. my language was. And what I did that for because every Hoosier that understands uh, contract law for over 200 years, Indiana has said that contracts longer than 10 years with no time frame in them are void after 10 years. And so that was uh, my thinking on my language for 10 years. But look, the language that got passed in 17's budget to stop it wasn't all my language, but it was most of it. I wanted to tweak it, but I didn't have the votes. You know, there are 71 legislators that are Republican, the balance is Democrat, and out of that 71, there are legislators that are Republican that represent very high density rural communities and they have to vote with their constituents. And so it's hard for them to understand different problems we have in different parts of the state because most of them don't have this kind of problem. So we was able to take that language and I will get whatever I can for my citizens to get a voice. I don't care how I get it, as long as it's done. And that's what we did in 17 budget. And the language for the waivers expires in 15 years it's not perfect. I don't think we need annexation at all involuntary. I think it all has to be voluntary. And that's the way I think uh, almost every other state except two are in this nation. So the waivers, the fire district, uh, what I have phone calls and emails and stopping in the stores is people want to know they're concerned. They're concerned about public safety. You've seen what's been happening in the newspaper, you know, shootings at the same place three times in the last three, four weeks. Things they find on the sidewalks and their yards, you know what I'm talking about, they're concerned. They just did a, uh, a, a study a year and a half or so ago that talked about population per capita and police presence. Bloomington is 40 some officers down for what the area they have now. My constituents are concerned if they expand to 10,000 and some acres, how are they going to, how many more officers will they have to hire? They say they got money now, but I've heard they haven't. I've heard the money issue with every city in town has been a consistent problem. And far as the the contracts, these waivers that were signed by a developer, let's say 40, 50 years ago, and it's had 10 residents that's purchased that property since, these residents didn't sign that. And there's reasonable expectations that you have as a resident, as a property owner, that those contracts should match state statute that says they should end in 10 years. That's a reasonable expectation. And I hope that if the city does sue for that issue, at least the judges will have some common sense and look back at Indiana's contract law and uphold those waiver laws. Uh, so um, if there's any other questions, I'd be more than happy to talk to you afterwards. You know, I, I give my phone number out. I work seven days a week. Uh, it's 812-327-8118. Or if you want to send an email, the easy email is h62 at in.gov. And it goes right to my staff. And all you got to do is, if you got a question, put, hey, Jeff said to contact him. Because a lot of these emails, sometimes they get boxed up. And, you know, we get a lot of emails. But just, um, well, yeah. So, look, th this, uh, this is a... A, a issue that we can win. We have 
the residents of Monroe County now, after these two law changes, we, we are on the plus side. We are on the plus side. And I think if it ends up in courts, we will be on the plus side again. But you need to get out. You need to call the, if you have friends on the city council or your neighbors that live in the city that can contact their representative and let them know this is an, a swelling that's just going to come right up in a tidal wave. And it's going to be hard for any city to overcome. You know, quite honestly, the mayor, if I was the mayor, I would have started over. I would have reconfigured my districts. I would have took, take these new laws into effect. I would make it a, a fair process because assessed valuations have changed. Revenue has changed. Look at the state. We got almost, what, $2 billion in extra revenue because of our economy because good leadership and those calculations are not in there. Now, maybe theirs are closely, but we're in a whole new ball field, a whole new ball game. And that's the best thing to do. They probably should have redone everything and started over and not been so big eyed on, I want everything now because you need revenue. Do what you can do what you can to, to spread your services out and provide good services and, and sell your plan to the public. Have a great plan where they'll say, I want to come into the city. I want to pay a little taxes. It's worth it. It's just like buying a car. You have to sell me that car is worth what you're, you're, you're trying to sell it for. So, and I want to again, thank the county commissioners. They have really done a bang up job, you know, bang up on job on letting the residents know about the, the tax raises and Marty Hawk and the rest of the county uh, council and from the auditor treasurer and even recorder. You guys have done a bang up job. You've kept everybody informed right down to, I get phone calls a few years ago, like, Hey Jeff, somebody's down here filing a bunch of paperwork. Something's going on. And this is what was going on. So thank you. And I appreciate the, uh, if you need any help, let me know. Uh, Bill Born again. Um, I just want to mention that I belong to Burton Woolley uh, Post 18 American Legion. Um, we have a we, we've had a homeless situation there, and it's cost. We were billed, and it's taken me from December 10th of last year to maybe. This week or next week, it's going to be final. Uh, but to clean our woods up, that's part of our property. We got a bill from Crisis Cleaning, who the uh, Monroe County, uh, uh, the Monroe County uh, Health Department, uh, Mike Large, Michael Large, if you know him, he's been extremely help helpful. And the first time two girls came out there and just walked through the area, they found over two, uh, two gallons full of needles just on our property, full of needles. We paid 5,200, now, th now the, the city of Bloomington, they didn't charge us for cleaning up the woods. So then crisis cleaning can come in there and clean up all the garbage. And I have, I, ha I have a, I have a, th I have a three minute and 17 second movie of that area in our woods that would I think blow your mind if you haven't been walked in this area. It's stacked this high and these encampments are as big as this building and it's just trash. And we got a $5,200 bill. The American Legion, we don't have that kind of money. We have to, we had to pull it out of our keisters for that. And now who's gonna take care of that? Why, why do we need to let these people come in and, and take over our property and we can't even do anything about it. If they're there, if these people were there at the time, I'm gonna tell you real quick what happened. I got a call from the police department when I was at the eye doctor. He said, Bill, you have people that are on your property and we have, a, we have two squad cars there, animal control and an ambulance is on its way. I said, what? He says, I think you need to go there. I'm a trustee at the American Legion. So I get there, this was December 10th. I get there, I'm in the, I get to the parking lot. He was right, all those cars were there, a few squad cars, a couple 
uh, officers. There was a, a woman officer who seemed to be taking the lead. She said, there's a guy down there. We have officers bringing him up. He just got bit by a dog, one of his dogs that are in the encampment. They put these dogs and animals in these tents and they leave them there all day and they're, all, they're barking their brains out. I mean, you gotta feel sorry for them if you're an animal. It doesn't, you know, it's just, it's terrible. It's, it's terrible. So anyway, she says, he wants to make a deal with you. Okay, so they bring him out of the woods. I get down there and he says, hey, I'd like to make a deal with you. I wanna, I wanna know if we clean up our mess can we stay here? It's like, well, I'm a trustee. I know what the answer is right now. And even if I wasn't a trustee, I know what my answer would be anyway. And uh, so I told him we have to take this to the trustees, the board of directors. But anyway, we got him out of there. I told him, here's the, here's the deal. We have, a, we have a lot of volunteers that are veterans that are willing to come down here and clean you guys out in a matter of, I mean, whatever we're all 65 and older you know what i mean i, I don't know that that's really going to happen but that's what i told them and they were out of there in two days now there's a there's three other properties there there's pyramid properties there's a piece of property that the the city owns and then there's culvers all to the all to the uh what is that west i'm new to bloomington a little bit so and they all had their properties cleaned at the same time. So I'm telling you, it turns into big money that we end up have to pay as, as, a, as, as, a, as a business, you know, and the legions are just a, you know, just a restaurant business. There's where you make two, 3% profit on a restaurant. You gotta be nuts to be in a restaurant business. But anyway, so I'll, I'll let that, I think everybody needs to know that we don't need to have any of these homeless people running around and costing us a lot of money unless Mr. Hamilton plans on uh, but can, taking can, care of it. Can we see if there's any questions uh, from the Zoom folks? They've been waiting. Yeah, just also. let me comment on this. If the city can't handle that, if they're spending all their money on that kind of thing, they can't handle having more property. You know, they can't handle keeping us all safe. We'll end up having to be like the colonists, you know. All right, can Zoom people hear me now? Yes. Excellent. That's good. Now I will read some of the questions from the chat. Just because Zoom couldn't hear me before, I'm going to reread what Marty Hawk said. Uh, for the record, it was a reminder that rents most likely will increase due to increase in tax of up to 2% of the value of the property. Um, and I said that earlier, but I wanted it on Zoom. Um, and then we have a question from Jen Richards. How do you find out if you have a waiver on your property that would prohibit remonstration? Mr. Cockrell? Well, I, first I would, I would, I want to stress that I wouldn't, there would be nothing that would prohibit remonstration. I would encourage anyone who feels strongly about it to go ahead and sign uh, the petition. The auditor's office and the city council are to, to, to look at those and see if there are valid waivers of remonstration or not. However, if someone really wanted to know, I think uh, they should contact the recorder's office. I believe they may be the, the, the county uh, body that can answer um, that question. But again, I, I wanna emphasize that there's a statutory process for certification of remonstrance petitions. Um, and that there is no penalty to, to sign a petition, even if you have a valid waiver, or even if you don't own a property in the, in the area. If you don't own property, I would prefer you, you not because we have to get through that. But if you're unsure, you know, I, I would not 
and you're against and you want to file a petition of remonstration, I would I would urge you to, to go ahead and we'll let the process uh, determine whether it's valid or not. And I believe that the recorder's office has asked that uh, questions be emailed to them. And you can do that at recorder at co.monroe.in.us. And that's also available through the county's website at co.monroe.in.us. Um, so are there other questions? We've got, we've got, we've okay. got probably four or five. Oh, from thank Zoom. you, thank you. Um, the next is from Shelly Kilgas, who asks, would you explain the 80% of assessed value bullet point again? Yes, um, every, every property has an assessed value associated with it, right? So if I'm an owner of a property and I sign the petition, I, it's, we're not going to look at it just as a percentage of the number of people who own properties with that, but we're, well, there will also be a assessed value associated with your signature as well. If, say, say, and I'll use a hypothetical, say that in one of the areas there's 10 properties um, and two people own 90% of the assessed value in that area and eight people do not, well, then it, you'd only need those two people to sign to get that 80% uh, threshold met. So it's the property, if the property value of those who sign the petition is greater than 80% of the total assessed value uh, in that annexation area, then that also voids the annexation. And again, I, I'll throw in my caveat that if it is a tax exempt property, that counts as zero for what its assessed value is for the purposes of this determination. All right. Uh, so next we have a comment from Susan Sandberg in the Zoom chat, uh, which is that the council will um, have their meeting on August 4th. There will be three minutes per speaker allowed. Um, and if there are a lot of, if there are a couple people in line, they may extend the time of the meeting past nine o'clock. If there are a lot of people left in line when they, when the meeting has to end at nine o'clock, um, they will continue the meeting to the next day, August 5th, starting at 6.30 PM. So that's just some information that was put in the Zoom chat. Um, and we have another question uh, from Callie in the Zoom chat. Um, I thought the previous annexation proposal that included that a new fire station was going to be built off of Tap Road, and is this still part of the annexation plan? That is a question the city of Bloomington will have to answer. Any else? Um, and uh, Marty Hawk is now asking, uh, and I, I think this is better addressed to the city, but will the city meeting remain open even if no speakers are waiting so people can show up anytime until nine o'clock? Then I would yes. say only the city could answer that. Yes. If I see it in the chat, I will relay it. Um, yeah. If we, she says we, something in the chat, we have up. yeah, we we have a city council member here. So, <laughs> yeah. Can can you come up to the microphone? Sorry, sir. Hello, thank you for the chance to speak with you. Um, I'm Sue Scambaluri. I'm on Bloomington City Council representing District 2, which is the north side, um, most, most directly adjacent to Area 7. Um, for the meeting on, on Wednesday night, um, we intentionally planned it. We chose to start it at 3 because we know that many people who comment might work second shift or third shift and we wanted to give them an opportunity to get in before they went to work. So that was the logic behind the three o'clock. It wasn't to exclude anyone. Um, as for extending until, that we actually planned on a six hour meeting, 
with a break in there somewhere for bathroom and dinner. And if there are a few people left at nine or a handful, I would argue for continuing it so we don't make people come back a second night. Um, do we stay, I think was the question, if nobody shows up right at three, do we just call it at 3.15 and go home? I would strongly argue against that. <laughs> um, we want this feedback. Um, and, and bravo, gold stars to all of you for actually being part of this conversation. There are many, many people who stayed home, some for very good reasons tonight. But thank you for being part of this conversation. Is there a north side of the Phoenix group that's the south side? Because you said you represent, you said you represent I represent District 2 on Bloomington City Council. The area most directly connected to the district I currently represent is Area 7, way up on the north side. And, and we have a, a follow-up question um, from Callie again. Um, if a new fire station is built to serve the new residents, that is detrimental to my neighborhood as that puts fire protection farther away from us. That's a comment. Again, that's a question for the city. Um, we, can't, we can't answer questions for them. And I saw someone had their hand up in the Zoom chat at one point, but I'm not sure if they still do. Um, at this point, why don't we move on? And there, there will be a chance at the end to answer general questions as well. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, next I want to introduce uh, Fire Chief uh, Dustin Dillard. He's the um, Fire Chief for the Monroe County Fire Protection District. And he's got some information about how this impacts um, folks uh, who are uh, in the county who may be targeted for uh, annexation as related specifically to their fire protection. So it's a very important question a lot of folks are interested in. Thank you. No problem. My name is Dustin Dillard. I'm the fire chief of the Monroe Fire Protection District. I was the fire chief in 2017 uh, on the last annexation process. Uh, the climate was much different at that time. Uh, we still had uh, several additional fire departments. We had Perry Clear Creek Fire District, Indian Creek Fire District, our Township Fire Department, uh, Van Buren Fire Department, and Bloomington Township Fire Department. Spurring from concerns at that time, uh, all of those fire departments mentioned have merged into one fire protection district. Benton and Washington Township are also merging into the fire district effective January 1 of 2022. The reasons for these mergers were, one, we operated as one anyway. We were a lot of individual departments, but we had mutual aid with each other. It was automatic. We relied on each other for every fire that we responded to. We handled a lot of the smaller emergencies ourselves, but if a structure fire went out, sending one fire truck with two people on it just wasn't sufficient. So we had conversations specifically with Indian Creek and Van Buren um, prior to the, the annexation uh, process in 2017, but that really brought people to the table for, for very serious reasons. Uh, one, there was concern about firefighters and, and how many firefighters would remain if annexation occurred. Uh, some of the fire departments that were looking to be annexed in 2017 were going to uh, see about a 44% reduction in revenue. Now what that means is, and this is what some people get held up on, Yes, if you were in the city area at that time and you were annexed, the Bloomington Fire Department, which does a tremendous job, was going to extend services to you. But for those folks left to the Township Fire Department or the Fire District, we were going to see a 44% loss in revenue, which meant the people remaining in the Fire District were either going to pay 44% more for the same services, or they were going to cut their services by 44%, services that were already struggling and looking for ways to expand. Now, when the merger took place, um, um, the Indian Creek was effective 2018, January 1, and the Bloomington Township and Van Buren merger took place January 1 of this year. Uh, under Indiana law, the fire district no longer is impacted by annexation. What that means is the city can still annex into a fire district, but a fire district of our size retains the responsibility for fire protection. 
The reason this is important is fire stations, fire trucks. You know, a fire truck currently brand new ranges between $600,000 and 1.5 million. A fire station ranges from 1.5 million to $3 million. You can't just up and move these things. They're put in areas specifically for the response zones. And when we do this long range planning, we build a fire station or we have a fire station like this that we've utilized since 1970, it's in a good spot. When the annexation occurs, if the fire district doesn't retain this, the, the individual on the on Zoom call was exactly right. All of these individuals who've had a fire station in their neighborhood on their street since 1970 would no longer have that fire station. So fortunately, we're in a position now where we get to look long range down the road. We don't have to worry about the annexation. We don't have to get involved in the, in the back and forths. We get to plan and say, okay, this is where a fire station is needed. This is where we're going to put a fire station. Now, to, to mention you know, one subject that was brought up earlier, and it was a conversation about um, your tax dollars. We talk a lot about property taxes. But we're really talking about your local income tax when we talk about the revenue that these other governmental entities are going to pay. Every citizen in Monroe County pays um, local income tax. They pay two types, the, the local option income tax and they pay the public safety income tax. The public safety income tax has kind of been a sore subject since 2016 because the fire district is excluded from receiving funds from that public safety income tax. So if you live in the county outside of the city, Funds go for your sheriff's office, they go to the Justice Department, things that are very, very important. However, funds that go to the city of Bloomington, if you, reside, if you are in a tax in Monroe County and you pay this income tax, the funds that go to the city of Bloomington, they don't go to the county sheriff, they don't go to the justice building, they go to city police, city fire, which is fine. But when you look at these equations, it doesn't even factor in the fire protection in the county. So the leverage that may are the, the tax levies that are um, levied on each and every one of us on our paychecks, um, your fire service in the county is not even taken into consideration. Uh, we apply for those funds. We are allowed to do it every year. We did not apply this year. The last several years, uh, we were told no based on literally the rep representative lines from city and Ellettsville representation saying that we shouldn't be entitled to that fund. In fact, we were told at one point we could raise our own taxes. That's what we should do. You are our people. We are trying to provide the best services we can. The merger allowed us to increase our staffing and really expand on the capabilities that we have. But without any control of our own, in 2025, we could see a reduction in half a million dollars with the same responsibilities. All of that does matter. It may seem like, oh, the library this, the, the justice system that, the fire district that, it's still your money. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's take, if you have questions, please come up to the microphone and we'll see, um, yes. Uh, we have I just have one thing from Susan Sandberg in the chat uh, saying, Sue is right. They will be there until nine o'clock and possibly beyond if necessary. Okay, thank you. Did you have a question? For uh, Chief Dillard, anybody else, please come up to the mic. Chief Dillard, could you just uh, tell us how do you get your, where do you get your funding? <laughs> okay, so the Fire Protection District is a special taxing district, similar to the Monroe County Solid Waste District, which means we're a standalone taxing uh, unit. Your dollars that come to the fire protection district, they're not in a general fund anywhere. They are at the fire department. That's where those dollars reside. Uh, we levy that tax and then we receive a local income tax distribution based on the percentage of our levy, just like the other units that were described. You mentioned that um, and something she asked though, how are you going to make it up, number one? So this is where the people of Monroe County who aren't being annexed are going to get hit big time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the only way they have to come up with it on your taxes. Um, because on that form where you had the one item and it showed it went up by a thousand and some percent, that was for fire protection for county residents. So that's going to kill us again. So my mother will get another couple hundred dollars added on there. Um, the other thing that wasn't mentioned the fire department at Perry Clear Creek, it's been here since I can remember. 
I used to live across the street on the corner out here when my kids were born and God, they're the oldest is 43 and the youngest is 30 or 31. I can't remember, bless her heart. Um, and yeah, we heard it and it was kind of annoying, but you're used to it. They always came to where they had to be. They had volunteers back then. I believe you were probably one of them. I remember a lot of kids at South used to do that. Um, but when it came time for annexation, they were told that they were gonna lose their fire stations and they were gonna lose their jobs because this would be city and they would have to apply to get a position with the city fire department, even though they'd been doing it for 10, 20, 30 years. And if you're over a certain age, was it 36 or whatever, you couldn't apply because you're too old. So if you're 37 and you've been doing this for 20 years, we'll see you later, bye, you lost your job. So there was more involved in this. It was wonderful that they were able to get legislation passed and get this fire district put in there. And that $200 a year, I won't begrudge them. We've never had a fire that I know of in the neighborhood where I live. My mother's never had a fire. They've never been called to any of these areas. They're going to somebody because they go by us out in the country, but they also respond to more than fire. They show up when an ambulance comes. I had a child when she was four doing silly gymnastic stunts and her and her sister flipped over and we think she collapsed her lung. Her sister landed on her and she couldn't breathe. And we called 911, sheriff, the ambulance, but the first people there were the fire department and the EMTs. And that's who shows up. And that's why you need these people. And that's why you don't want to have the city trying to cover more and more area that they can't cover now. We need to keep what we have now, pay for what we need to pay. And if that means more taxes, fine, but don't annex us and take our animals away that we have in our yards and tell us we have to move. Don't take people's jobs away. Don't do this to us. We didn't ask for it. We don't need to be annexed. The mayor doesn't need to do this. The city council doesn't need to do this. If they're short of money, stop doing some of the parks. Stop building another rails to trails that now they have to have security at that area down there because they have so many people down there, transients and drugs and stuff that we're paying security at nighttime to keep people out of the parks. How sad. You know, we have places for people to go, but some people don't want to be there. And I'm sorry for that. I contribute to Community Kitchen. I con contribute to the Hoosier Hills Food Bank. Our church does meals at one of the local places for people on certain um, Sundays of the month and things like this. We donate, we help, we do Salvation Army, we do everything. But we can't keep putting Band-Aids on problems. We have to say, stop paying for extras until we fix what we've got now and stop trying to make the people in the county solve the problems in the city. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I just I just want to note something um, just just for clarity's sake to make sure that everyone's clear on this. Um, the ability to create a fire district is something the Board of Commissioners can do. And we could have made that decision and just said everyone who's not in the city or in the town of Ellisville is going to be. We did not do that. We purposefully set up something that was time consuming for um, our townships that wanted to join because we said you have to have public meetings, you have to show the financials, and we have to, to hear from people who do not want to move to the fire district. We had public hearings each and every time. That was something we did not have to do, but we did it because we knew it was the right thing to make sure that we heard from the people who were gonna be impacted the most. Now, everybody's decided to join and they have joined. Now, now that you, if you are already covered by the Monroe County Fire Protection District, to be clear, that will continue. You will not, you will not receive city fire services. Uh, and so they're going to, the city is going to have to figure out a way to take that fire service out of their current city tax bill. Because currently it's part of everything. They don't, they don't assess separately for fire, but they're going to have to figure out how to do that. That's their problem. Uh, that's their issue they're going to have to deal with if annexation goes through. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that it's not that you're going to lose your fire service. If you're in the fire protection district, you are in the fire protection district and annexation is, they, they have to, they have to solve that tax bill problem 
uh, before they do anything else. Commissioner Githens? Yeah, I think that there are a few people. Sorry, I think that there are a few people in Richland right. Township that um, that doesn't hold true for. Right, yeah. right. I've just said if you if you currently are in the fire protection district, you are you're going to stay in the fire protection district. That's yeah, because there are some folks who are targeted for annexation who are not currently in the fire protection district. So very good. Thank you. Um, anything else, Hans? I don't think so, but give me just a second. Okay. We're going to check to see if there are more questions. Um, to, and to this lady's very, very fine point about the job security of these public servants who do go out of their way and they risk our, and they literally risk their lives to, to, to keep us all safe. Um, I think that the city has shown that they have some disregard for, for, uh, for those people's jobs. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are they going to do to the sheriff's deputies who are also going to be put into this, this as well? They're not going to be able to, 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 uh, to have the funds to employ all those people. Are they going to have to, have to go into the city and are they going to have the same benefits that they have had in the county? And the answer to that is probably not if the city is even willing to hire them all. So. Any other questions here or uh, for, for Mr. Uh, okay, go ahead. I, I haven't heard back, um, but uh, Shelly Kilgas um, asks, is Richland Township part of the fire district? And I think I know the answer, but. Right. No, it's not. Right. So, so just to clarify, uh, Richland Township is not in the fire district. They contract for services with the Ellettsville Fire Department. So what that means is, is if the city annexes into Richland Township, the parts that are annexed will receive Bloomington Fire Services. The parts that remain will still need to contract with the fire department but they'll have less funds available. The same case goes for Salt Creek Township who contracts with the district. Those in Salt Creek Township who are annexed will get Bloomington Fire Services. Those remaining will, will still need to contract, but there will be less revenue. Thank you, next question. Uh, Jennifer McKell. Um, so somebody said that it was necessary that we have so many police per person so many portions of a policeman per person. So uh, I didn't really understand the last comment, but obviously the city will have to, if we're in the annexed city, we are gonna have to have police, more police than we have now actually, because we hardly have anybody. The, the poor old sher sheriff who actually covers all of the county, including the city, really it, um, hardly has anybody because we have to give all the money to the city. So, uh, we will have to have more police, right? Um, covering all of us people out here in the county, right? The question for Mr. Cockrell or for the city? I'm not sure, Mr. Cockrell, if you wanna. Well, I, I, I think it's really a question for the city on their staffing of the police. Um, I could tell you that the the county council is going to have to look at the budget impl implications that I think uh, Mr. Mr. Rogers had talked about today and, and kind of ponder the answers to those. And, and, you know, as far as I know, everything's on the table for that. Thank you. Um, any general questions from anybody here or on Zoom? You can either raise your hand on Zoom or you can chat to the panelists on Zoom uh, and the question will be re relayed to us. Uh, while we're waiting, I just wanna thank everyone again for being here. Um, Dean Rogers from Baker Tilly, uh, Fire Chief Dustin Dillard and um, Monroe County Attorney Jeff Cockrell. Um, and a special thank you to the Monroe County Fire Protection District and Chief Dillard for hosting us today very comfortably. Thank goodness it is a cool August day. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Thank you for hosting us. Uh, and a huge thank you to our technical services department for managing the hybrid meeting. They're doing a great job. Thank you so much. All right, Jamie Ford again. Um, a couple of questions, I guess, for you and the, the commissioners as well. Um, all this revenue that the city is going to be generated, if you do lose this money, but something happens, um, it, has the city said like, hey, don't worry, it's come to us, but we have a good working relationship, we'll help fund should you need it? I mean, does that happen with like the schools and the library as well? Or 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm new to Bloomington, so I don't know yeah. if there's, is there a good relationship between the city and the county, or is it just kind of, this there's, is leaving you hanging to there's, dry? There's no legal mechanism I know of that the city could say, hey, we're going to give you this money to ensure that you're funded well. Um, there may be such a thing. I don't know of it. Um, I, I wouldn't anticipate that happening because they will have their own expenses with annexation because they're going to have to increase services. That would be my guess, but that would be a great question for the city. Then I have one more question. Um, on the packet that the city um, mailed to us, the first class on page seven, it said, um, let's see, uh, quote, the fiscal plan also identifies over 60 million in cash reserves that could be available to the county to assist in the transition, end quote. Is that, is that true? Could be available to the county? Yes, yeah, page seven of the, the packet that was mailed out. Right, you can take a look at it if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -uh. Oh, it's it's on the book, so it's on the website. It's on the website. It's on the website. It's on the website. Yeah, yeah. Good deal. Thank you. Do you know anything about it? Do you want to say that? Or? Okay. We don't know any. We we don't know anything about it. So um, that that's news to us. <laughs> So the Jamie Ford again, the question I was asked is how I got this packet. Um, I had a yellow tag in my mailbox and I had to go to the post office and sign for it like a regular package that, you know, that when they leave it saying, oh, it's too big to fit in your mailbox or something like that. It was one of those. So I had to go and sign for it saying that I received it. And then it had a packet with um, a letter from the mayor and a thing giving a very basic brief, in my opinion, kind of misleading um, information rundown on annexation costs, how, you know, blooming. I live over um, close to the, the country club. So I'm, I'm in area 1B. All right, all right, we can't, okay, Zoom, fo folks on Zoom can't hear you at all if you're not at the microphone. So we, we, we have some information here. Okay. Yeah. We have some information here. So I haven't seen this document either. What I suspect it is, and, and you may be able to correct me, but by law, the city was required to send out a, a, a detailed summary of the fiscal plan. So I'm assuming that's mm -hmm. the document that you have. That's what it seems like, but the, I also went to the city hall to request a copy of the actual fiscal plan, which is like 900 pages, 600 pages, something like that. So yeah, this is very much like, very trimmed down, like. Right, yeah, it would, it would be very expensive. I'm assuming oh, yeah. to mail out the entire document. So yeah, yeah. The, just by law, they have to send out a detailed summary of the fiscal plan. Yeah, that's what it is. Thank you. And, and we, we, do have, we do have one thing from, from Zoom. One moment, okay. Uh, Bill Bourne again. Uh, I'm gonna throw a little curveball in here. Are any uh, students, IU students that are not residents of Bloomington have anything to do with this annexation? I, I don't know what you mean. I know I don't know what I mean it, either, it, okay. but I do. But I do know that that the, that I do know that the students have the ability to vote, and that's kind of blows my mind that they that it doesn't matter where they live, they can live in India, they can come here and go to school and at IU and they could vote for for somebody on the. Uh, well, first of all, you have to be a U.S. citizen to be eligible. Well, okay, to vote, so but you could be a U.S. US but, citizen, right? But but they could still vote, not right, be a res resident. resident. Right. But but the issue here is whether or not they can impact the annexation. And if they are not property owners in the area to be annexed, then they cannot influence. I, I know that's the answer, yeah. but I needed to throw oh. that in there. Sure. Oh. Sure. All right. We have a question from Zoom. We just have a, one thing from Marty Hawk asking, is this the ARPA funds? No idea how the city came up with that dollar amount. Yeah, well, I, I don't know either. And if it's the American Rescue Plan Act dollars, then those are already going to the city and the county and other taxing units anyway. And it has nothing to do with annexation. So I don't think that that's what this is. But I have no idea what that number is, uh, but you can bet I'm going to ask tomorrow night. 
Anyone else? Other questions, general questions, Zoom? All right, thank you. Thank you all for, okay, please come on up. Sorry, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, reach out. If, if anybody listening on Zoom or, or anybody here would like to uh, get involved and, and, and volunteer for County Residents Against Annexation, you can uh, shoot us an email at stopbloomingtonannexation at gmail.com. That's stopbloomingtonannexation at gmail.com. Or give us a phone call at 812-361-4424. 812-361-4424. If you reach out to us, we would be happy to get you in, involved and, 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 we, and we'd love to have your help. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And again, thank you everyone for being here today. And again, thank you to our hosts. And hopefully we got some of your questions answered. And I know it's not perfect, uh, but, but we wanted to provide at least some information for you all as county residents to understand what's happening. Um, we'll, we'll hang around for a few minutes to see if there's anything else that's needed. And if not, we'll go ahead and, and end this meeting. Thank you again, TSD and everyone for being here and presenting today. Thanks.